Well, it's been a quiet week in Lake Wobegon, Minnesota, my hometown, <laughs> out on the edge of the prairie. It's been cold, it's been cold, it's been in the low teens, highs in the day. We don't do wind chill uh, in Lake Wobegon. It seems like bragging to us somehow. <laughs> gives people an excuse not to go do things they ought to do. They ought to get up, get out, go, do. But church was very, very, very sparsely attended. Lake Wobegon Lutheran Church on Sunday, Pastor Liz gave the sermon on the wedding at Cana where Jesus turns the water into wine and just a few, few people there. She went to visit people during the week, of course, shut-ins, which there are more of now in this kind of weather. And People sort of apologetic and trying to invent reasons they didn't go to church on Sunday. Mavis said, I feel like I was coming down with a cold. I didn't want to spread it. But no need for confession, no need for absolution. She was fed a lot of rich pastry, people guilty because they hadn't been in church. And she felt very heavy and laden when she got back to the parsonage, as if she had, in fact, taken her, their sins unto herself. It was a, an odd trip. It was beautiful because we got a little fresh snow, a little sprinkling here, a little sprinkling there to freshen things up. There's a, there's a road that goes north and just off the county road and around the, around the north end of the lake. It's so gorgeous at a certain time of day in the gloaming, in the twilight, in the dusk. It just takes your breath away and it distracts some people and they, and they look out there across the lake at that, at that village of fish houses out there. And before they know it, they're off the road and they've, and they've, and they've skidded off. And now as long as they're off, they might as well go all the way. So they drive out onto the ice and now they go visit people out there in the, in the village, and they, and they sit around with old men who are, who are drinking brandy, and they're, and they're talking. And people try to avoid complaining about winter because it's just so boring, you know. And, and, and to, to, to sit and say, boy, it's a cold one out there is, is, is the equivalent of saying, boy, it's flat around here, isn't it? It's a why are there not, not too many buildings in this town over two stories high, are there? Gosh, there are a whole lot of Norwegians here, aren't there? I mean, you're just pointing out the obvious. Why would you, why would you need to do that? So instead of complaining about winter, they, they talk about winters that were even colder than this one. And if you get old people my age, they can go back before the memory of most of the people who were listening to them, which, which gives them more freedom to, <laughs> to tell about it. That, that winter of 1951, I, I remember especially when Mr. Idsty was showing me how you could put red pepper in your shoes to keep your feet warm. And, <laughs> He insisted that it worked. It didn't work for me. So he said, well, I'll try, try chili pepper then. So I did that. It didn't work. My feet got very cold. He said, you're, you're Norwegian, aren't you? I said, no, we're Scots English. Oh, he said, well, that's the reason. That's the reason. <laughs> Your people were made to suffer, that's all. And so it just, it wouldn't, it wouldn't work with you. It made a big, made a big impression on me at the time. That was the same winter, 1951, where, where the deer came into town and they, and they were just begging for shelter. And, and, but they were moving so slowly in the cold that it didn't seem fair to shoot them. And so some of the hunters took the deer up to the high school and they put them in the gymnasium so that <laughs> so that they would warm up, and then they let them out. But it was so cold that the bullets became smaller caliber. <laughs> and so they wouldn't fire. They, 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 they fired the gun, and the bullet just dropped out of the end of, of the barrel. There was one old deer. He was a 10-point buck, and he just laughed, and he laughed. He was wheezing and bent all over died of a heart attack. And uh, 
They strung him up. You can look this up. It was in the, it was in the Lake Wobegon Herald Star. It was a, it was a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful thing. Margie Krebsbach was driving that, that route out north of town along that gravel road. It was dusk. She just finished teaching at school, and she, and she looked out across, across the lake and, and the lights twinkling out there and, and, that, and that pale white glow from, from the lake and snow was falling, and she thought of... She thought of that poem, loveliest of trees, the cherry now is hung with snow along the blah bow and stands along the woodland ride wearing white for Christmas tide. And she was distracted and she went in the ditch and bounced up out of the ditch and ran into a spruce tree. She called Carl on her cell phone and he said, do you want me to come rescue you? Well... She just wanted to let him know that she would be late. <laughs> but there was a sound in his voice. She said, sure. So he came out in his red Ford 150 pickup, and he, and he pulled it up alongside her car. She was sitting there, motor running. She's perfectly warm. He opened up the door of her car and looked at her there in her in her charcoal pantsuit and her white frilly blouse. And she was sitting there on the cell phone texting. He had a blanket and he wrapped it around her, her and her high heels, and he lifted her up in his arms and he carried her to his pickup and set her in. He had never done that before. He drove her home. He said, don't worry about it. I'll take care of everything. They drove home, and he ran her a hot bath, and he put, he put bubbles in it, peppermint, which she knows is his favorite flavor. And he went off, and he made the calls, and he, and he came back up to tell her that the wrecker was on its way and was going to get her car out, and everything would be fine. And he had a towel in his hand. She sat there, surrounded by bubbles in the bath. And he reached out his hand, and he pulled her up, and she stood there, his wife, naked. And he wrapped the towel around her, and he lifted her up in his arms, and he turned towards the door, just as they heard Carl Jr. say, is anybody in there? <laughs> and he was starting to open the door, and Carl just put his shoulder to the door and slammed it. He said, well, excuse me, Carl Jr. said. Carl Jr. has been living with them since September. He majored in English, and uh, <laughs> sort of been working on a memoir, and uh, working for his grandpa's Chevrolet agency. What are you doing in there, he said. None of your business, Carl said. None of your business. He tried to escape into the bedroom, Carl holding his wife in his arms, but he could sense that Carl Jr. was watching them from around the corner. So he put Margie in the bedroom and he went off, and then the mood sort of passed. <laughs> Carl Jr. has been working on some short stories about older people leading small, constricted lives in small towns, <laughs> repressed by the culture around them, and there he is in his own home repressing his parents <laughs> left and right. It's a very... It's a very odd, odd situation. So they went down to the Chatterbox Cafe. The dish down at the Chatterbox Cafe is a chicken stew with uh, wild rice and, uh, and, and rhubarb pie with ice cream for dessert. They sat down there with the others, people talking about, people talking about winter, not complaining about it, you understand, just talking, talking about 
That winter of 1951, yet the ground was so cold, frozen so far down, 10, 12 feet down, they couldn't bury people. So they simply put them out in a shed up by the cemetery. They just leaned the bodies up <laughs> against the side. It was interesting to look at them there. People had a healthy, morbid interest back then. They weren't so, 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 so touchy about this back then. Four, five, then six people dead, lying there. Sometimes their eyes would open in the cold and they'd have to be closed again, but all leaning against each other. People who hadn't liked each other that much. And they're, they all were. They didn't put them in coffins because you didn't need coffins when it was that cold. And, and, and besides, people didn't want to spend the money. They thought maybe the price would be cheaper in the spring. So <laughs> that was a very cold winter, 1951. That was, the, that was the year that mosquitoes were killed off in Minnesota. We'd always had mosquitoes through the winter, a different species of mosquitoes. They were big, like hummingbirds. And that, that was the year that those mosquitoes were, 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 were killed off in Minnesota. Now we just have this lesser, this weaker species of, of mosquito. We, we get them in February, and, uh, and they stay with us for a while, but not so, not so terribly, terribly long. That was the cold, cold winter that Sina Halverson, she met her beau. She was a young woman, she loved ice fishing and she was very good at it. The men loved to have her there when she was a little girl and she would be, she would be out there participating. She would have a little brandy, little brandy with some soda pop and she would fish and she would take the hooks out of the lower lips of fish. She would put the bait on the hook. She was good. She, she smoked a cigar from the time she was 10, 12 years old. And she loved brandy. She learned how to swear. She, she, they had belching contests out there. She learned how to pee for distance and uh, Then her mother said, no, you can't hang out there anymore. You'll never get a husband if you're, if you're out there ice fishing with those crude, vulgar men. You stay in. She taught Sina how to, how to embroider and how to, and how to quilt and, 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 how to, and how to cook fish and so on. But, but the only men who were interested in her were the men who were also interested in needlework. And, <laughs> crocheting, and so she was 21, 22, and she hadn't met anybody yet. And then her father snuck her out into the fish house, and she was out there with a whole gang of them. They were having a belching contest, and they were seeing who could belch the farthest into the alphabet. <laughs> they could get up to F-G-H-I-J was as far as anybody could get. And this sweet and beautiful, beautiful flaxen-haired beauty, she, she simply bent slightly over, and she farted, O come, all ye faithful, <laughs> with the amen at the end. And it was a beautiful, beautiful thing. She was married to one of the fishermen. He was impressed. With a woman that gifted, you would never be entirely bored. You would never lack for <laughs> entertainment. No. It was a cold, cold winter, 1951. That was a year I remember, I remember going over to get my Aunt Flo's car out of the driveway. I was supposed to shovel her car out, and my dog went with me, and, uh, and I... I could see what he was going to do. He was running alongside the car, my car, as I was driving over to Aunt Flo's, and Uncle Al was there, and the dog stopped at a, at a lamp post. It was so cold, I knew this was dangerous. The dog raised his right leg, and I yelled at him, but he peed anyway, and then he yelped, a yelp of pain, because, because, well, there was a yellow arc <laughs> from his vitals to the lamppost. 
It had frozen in the air. I got out of the car. I kicked it. He yelped again. He recovered. It took him a few days. And he was very shy about peeing after that. I told Aunt Flo about it. Oh, she said, the same thing happened to my husband, your Uncle Al. <laughs> same thing happened. It was so cold, and I warned him about it, but he had to go so bad, and he did. And then I got a call from the constables, and he had to go in the hospital. And he was in the hospital for two days. I said, was he okay? She said, well, he was okay, but before that, he had been phenomenal. That was the winter of 1951. I wish you'd been there. Anyway, that's the truth. That's the news from Lake Wobegon, where all the women are strong, all the men are good-looking.